Welcome, everyone. There's still some seats in the front row if anybody would like to take a seat. There are quite a few up here. It's wonderful to see so many of you. I'm Cornelia Holstrank. I'm the executive director of the Keller Center. It's a real delight for me to introduce you to James Mee. He's going to be talking about entrepreneurship in China and venture capital in China. And today's talk will be co-sponsored by both the Keller Center and the Center on Contemporary China at Princeton. And frankly, I can't think of two better hosts given the topic that James will be focusing on today. So the Keller Center is focused on innovating engineering education and fostering entrepreneurship and design on campus. And the Center on Contemporary China is focused on the study of contemporary China, as the name implies, as well as looking and providing substan substantive analysis from social science perspectives on the dramatic sociological shifts that are taking place in today's China. Many of you may know that the Keller Center is expanding its very popular Princeton Startup Immersion Program. This program is a 10-week internship program which provides students the opportunity to gain a global sense of entrepreneurship. There are currently two nodes. There's one in Tel Aviv, and there's one in New York. And if anybody wants to guess where the third one will be, any, any guesses? <laughs> it, it'll, it'll be in Shanghai, and we're really excited about that. And so this past August, my colleague Lillian Zhang and I had the unique opportunity to visit Shanghai and actually to visit with James. And we were both really uh, so appreciative uh, of his generosity while we were there. And also, we, more than that, really, we, we were able to witness firsthand the profound impact that he has had on countless entrepreneurs in the area. So we're really, really thrilled to have James with us. Now on to a little bit of a more formal uh, introduction on James. James is the founding partner of Lightspeed China Partners, which is a leading China-focused early stage venture capital firm. He ranks number 59 on Forbes 2018 VC Midas list of top VCs globally, and is on Forbes China media list of top VCs in China. He has over 16 years of operations experience at leading high-tech companies and startups. Before founding Lightspeed China, James was the global partner of Lightspeed Venture Partners, a leading early-stage venture capital firm in the US. Prior to that, James spearheaded Google's early efforts in China, first as its head of Asia products and the chief representative of Google China, and later as a director of corporate development he was responsible for strategies, products, and investments. And during this tenure, he led investments in leading Chinese internet companies, such as Beidou, Yangping, Chonglei, and Ganji. Before joining Google, James co-founded a venture-backed startup, iTeleco Communications, a voice over IP global communication products and services company. And prior to iTelco, James was with Intel, where he held many management positions in engineering, marketing, product management, and business development. He co-invented the MLC NOR Flash technology, which developed into Intel's billion-dollar StratoFlash business. He received his master's in electrical engineering from Princeton and holds a BS in physics from Fudan University. In addition, he holds over 14 US patents in flash memory, communications, internet security, and commerce. I'm so delighted that you're here today with us, James. And please join me in welcoming James. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cornelia. It's uh, so glad to be back at the Princeton. And, uh, it, it, uh, it's just a special feeling, and, uh, um, and I was a little bit overwhelmed, actually. And I know this is a midterm week, and uh, so thank you for <laughs> uh, coming over here. And I hope that I can share with you some of the development to what I have seen in the past, uh, my career path. And uh, just to, Cornelia actually mentioned about my journey after Princeton, and uh, just one small tidbit. Uh, I want to share with you that um, 
at, when I was studying electrical engineering at Princeton, I was working on silicon germanium materials. They tried to make new semiconductor devices. And I got really interested in technologies in the semiconductor space. And, uh, but I want to do, I really want to see the action in the industry firsthand, which is really happening in the Silicon Valley. So I cold called Intel at that time, and I literally called the operator. Say, do you have a college recruiting group? And uh, they connected me, and their lady, Cindy Romero, answered my phone and uh, gave me an opportunity. I actually had a phone interview later on, and I got myself a summer intern opportunity at Intel. So that's how I started. But unfortunately, that took me to Intel, and I stayed there for seven years instead of coming back to Princeton to finish my PhD. So that's something I always regret. I, I didn't finish. I, I wish. Princeton will have some very long extended period for students can come back and, uh, and uh, finish the work. Um, another tip that I want to share with you is uh, I work at Intel for seven years. And uh, when you are in Silicon Valley, you get somehow, you get a bug for trying to do a startup yourself. Because every corner you turn on a, a street corner, a very nondescriptive building, and you say, wow, this is, this is a company that I have heard about in a high-tech industry. So you see those entrepreneurship, it's really very, very strong over there. And I was thinking about doing a startup myself, but a semiconductor, you know, it's not easy. It's very capital intensive. So in 1999, uh, I met with Google founder. And Google was still a company with less than 20 employees. And because they started in a little garage, the house is in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley. It just happened that the house owner, Susan Wojcicki, was my colleague at Intel. And so he introduced me to the Google founder. And uh, we chatted. Uh, it was fascinating service. The search experience so much different from what I get from other services. But then I was talking to them about uh, how do you make money, right? And they still don't know. So I was actually given an offer to join them as employee number 20. And um, I took the offer and I came back home and talked to my wife, Teresa, and said, hmm, that option offer is less than 1%. That sounds really low, right? And, uh, and, and uh, I said, the company still haven't figured out how they are going to make money. And I was really thinking about doing a startup myself. So I think I made a smart decision. I turned them down. <laughs> And I went off, did my own startup. So the lesson learned now is don't turn down offers from by startup very too quickly. <laughs> and also you need some imagination because eventually the, the startup company when they started, and they will end it up on a path could be very, very different from where they started. So that's the exciting part of the being an entrepreneur doing startups. And um, um, I also want to share another kind of a story, personal story of mine that uh, I have working in the Silicon Valley for about 13 years and working in China for about similar time. And uh, if, you, if you go back to the 13 years ago, uh, the innovation is mostly happening globally in US and probably more in Silicon Valley. Now we are seeing New York City is becoming very vibrant for startups. Uh, but increasingly, globally, the innovation you see in Tel Aviv and uh, even more so in China. Um, so one company I invested over 11 years ago is a company called Dianping. And how many of you have heard about that company? Oh, OK. So for those of you who haven't heard about the company, so they are the Yelp for China. They started before Yelp. Uh, eating is a big deal in China. <laughs> and so people are going to restaurants and they get so many choices, right? So this company started with user-generated review. They literally printed books like Zagat at the very beginning and it turned into an internet service. So I invested over 11 years ago and the company had zero revenue. They don't know how to make money either. So um, we can talk about why I invested, but the, the story was it took them over 11 years. So they eventually merged with a second player in the industry called Meituan. So now they become Meituan Dianping. 
and just went public last month. And now their market cap was, when I invested, is about 20 million valuation. And now they went public, it's about 55 billion US dollar public company. So good things happen and takes time. It takes over 11 years, right? So don't give up. When you do a startup, when you are on something really, really good, don't give up too easily. And there are many times, actually, I, initially when I was investing them, I gave them the offer to acquire the whole company. I was at Google. I made an offer to acquire the whole company for $16 million. And the founder, he said, I need a, I need a day to think about it. And the, the second day he came back, he said, I probably can retire and by selling the company, but I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm still young. What do I do, right? I don't want to play golf all the time. And uh, I want to do something. And the thing I really want to do is work on the campaign. And that's kind of the spirit for entrepreneurs. And they want to create uh, things that people really need it. Um, and the, the other story is uh, if you look at the growth in China 11, 12 years ago, Dianping was starting with really rudimentary services, right? But another example is a company I invested three years ago. It's a company called the Ping Duo Duo. Okay, I see some people knocking, nodding their heads. And, uh, okay, so I think this company, not many people know about it because they only started three years ago. What they do is they do e-commerce. And what's the biggest e-commerce company in, in, in China? Alibaba, Taobao, right? It's a public company on US, uh, in the US. It's over 500 billion uh, market cap. And certainly it's kind of a, a really big player. They have been running for Jack Ma started the company in 1994. And the second biggest player is JD. It's very similar to Amazon. It's about a $40 billion uh, market cap company. So everybody think e-commerce is well taken by these two big players. What's the opportunity for startups, right? So this company, I tell you the, the it kind of the growth. They started three years ago from zero. Now they have over 300 million paying customers and uh, 60 billion transactions, and it just went public on New York Stock, uh, on NASDAQ, also last month, with a 22 billion US dollar market cap. And that's the growth from zero to a public company with 22 billion. So that's kind of the growth. It's indicative of the innovation in China. It's actually really accelerating. Um, I can talk about how they actually build that business. It's very, very unique. They leverage social network, uh, very different from Taobao or JD. Um, so with that, um, I, I, I think Princeton, we always look at data. <laughs> so I, I, I will show with you maybe some of the, a little bit of uh, some of the slides and very quickly give you some perspective about the why these companies, startups, can grow so quickly. And I think fundamentally, it's just the market size. And if you look at the GDP growth, and the China growth is actually at the top and uh, similar to India, but in terms of the absolute volume, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, number two in the world, and it's about 5.5 times more than India. India is a really a, com a country I think people really should pay attention. That will be, have a tremendous growth in the future. And this is a very interesting slide. It shows the top 20 internet companies in the world, mostly public companies. And nine out of these 20 companies, the top 20 companies in the world, nine out of them are Chinese companies. And uh, um, the rest of the 11 companies are US company, tech companies. So you see Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, right? And the average history of these 11 US companies, tech companies, are 20 years. And Google celebrated their 20 year anniversary just recently. So that's the average history. And, um, and their market, actually, addressable market, actually, is global. Um, not only US market, but the European and other markets. But these Chinese companies, there are nine out of the 20, their market is mostly just China market itself. 
and their average history is only eight years. So they are on a much faster growth trajectory. And uh, so fundamentally, um, it's, it's really driven by the sheer market size. And if you look at the internet users or mobile users, um, it's, it's around 700 million out of the 1.2, 1.3 billion population. Um, and uh, there's also a big component of uh, what we call the digital natives. They grew up using internet and uh, mobile devices, and that's about 300 million people. That's defined as under 25 year old, uh, we call digital natives. So that's really a number we really pay attention um, uh, for, for a lot of the innovative news services. And these are some of the industry segments comparing the volumes of the transactions. And we, we only compare the China market and the US market specifically. Uh, so the mobile payment, uh, there are two top players. This is one of them called Alipay, it's Alibaba mobile service. And uh, Amazon is very big, although globally Amazon is even bigger. But if you just look at the US market compared with uh, Taobao, which is in the China. So that goes on. And travel definitely expedia is, uh, is still bigger. Uh, China uh, sea trip market is about half of the US size. But if you look at the others, um, that's really the sheer local size market is really driving that kind of a startup opportunities. And this is another um, uh, slide, I, if you can see it, is before people usually in China startup ideas, mm, what's working in US, what's working in Europe, and people try to duplicate that model in China. And now it's, it's actually turning around because the mobile space, um, the users in China typically they change their cell phones every two, three years in a much faster pace. They embrace the new applications. So a lot of interesting uh, services, for example, bicycle sharing, right? Uber started with car sharing, but bicycle sharing is really started in China. And it's really uh, growing to other uh, markets. And um, um, this, is, this is really a takeout delivery. Uh, the company I mentioned, the uh, Yelp, kind of a model, the Dianping, the biggest business actually is food delivery, takeout delivery. They deliver 20 million orders a day, a single day. And they hire a lot of people. But what's really driving is, is the algorithm behind it. So they can really, a single person can go to seven different restaurants and pick it up and go to different housing units and very, very efficiently and cost effectively. So that, that's their, one of their biggest, biggest business. And this one, uh, this is called Hema Xianshen. It's a new concept supermarket. Anybody has used it? Wow. Five, six, seven. Wow. So this is, this is well, how do I describe it? You know, Amazon acquired Whole Foods, right? What they are trying to do is to do the most difficult part of the e-commerce, which is deliver grocery. You think about it. Right. Amazon, all the other goods you can deliver, you have a warehouse and you can find a cheap location and outside the city. But grocery is perishable goods. And people, when they are cooking, they need it quickly. They can't wait for the second day, right? So Whole Foods now is quiet because they have the warehousing capabilities and close to the neighborhoods. Um, I don't know what's the latest uh, delivery time, the shortest delivery time for Whole Foods to, what, what is it? Is it uh, two hours? Roughly, so what? What's interesting uh, in China? Uh, this company called Hema Xianshen, they are incubated by Alibaba, so they manage to deliver pretty much everything within thirty minutes, and you get spoiled. <laughs> uh, and so, how? And people say, how do you do it? If I drive to the supermarket and go to the different produce and the different section, pick up everything else, and uh, that takes more than 30 minutes. So they totally redesign the supermarket. You still have an offline experience. You can go in there, you can eat, but every order that you put on the cell phone, it automatically will be broken down to different section, and there are people in that section, they, the price tag is so digital. It's using the e-ink technology. 
and it can really quickly for the people to pick it up. And they put it in the bag and they put on the on the ceiling it is a conveyor belt. And very quickly go to a central section and they very quickly sort it out. And there's a delivery person taking a scooter, go to your apartment. But fundamentally, I think China has one interesting social factor, which is the density of the population. That is very, very different. Uh, because Shanghai and Beijing population is about 25 million in a single city, right? San Francisco is about 1 million. So with that population density, you could actually offer a service. Actually, it could be very cost effective <coughs> because there are more and more users living in the same apartment complex. They are ordering it. So the same person taking the scooter, they are taking not just one person's grocery order, but multiple ones. Um, so that's the interesting part of the startup opportunities that not necessarily can easily duplicate it in the US, but they're applicable to other, East, uh, other Asian cities as well. Um, um, so I, I, I think it's uh, um, one thing um, we also observed that the entrepreneur spirit by the Princeton community uh, in China, surprisingly, I mean, Princeton is uh, such a tight, close-knit group, right? And, uh, and we don't have as many, uh, last time I checked the LinkedIn, Princeton alum in Silicon Valley, that it's not a big number, right? In China, it's not a big number either. But surprisingly, there's a very high percentage of Princeton alum in China are doing startups, startups are very successful startups. And one of them, uh, Liu Lishu, and founded by uh, a computer science uh, graduate in the class 2007, uh, sorry, 2009, and uh, the company is an AI-based education company teaching English without having a real person that actually have to do it, uh, just went public in US. And uh, so, so that's the part I, I think is uh, looking at my own experience and, and the, it relates to your own experience. I think the Keller Center and the many of the resources available and the students that are thinking about entrepreneurship, that's really happening very, very actively in China. Um, and um, so this is, uh, uh, this is just a very quick uh, kind of uh, uh, the e-commerce and the mobile payment and then the unicorn companies. And uh, increasingly, globally, the unicorn company in China that accounts for about 36% of the total unicorn companies. That means a billion dollar or more market cap companies and versus about 41% of the uh, coming out of uh, US. Uh, and but that's driven mostly by the market share size of the uh, uh, the uh, local market. And so this is another data point. I, I uh, you, you are familiar with startups, and uh, uh, but from venture capital industry, that usually is not very well uh, explained. Um, so what 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 really is venture capital? Is really if you look at a Google. So when I was given an offer. I, I really don't know. I can't tell. It's because we were talking about joining the company, and uh, Sergey was pitching me to the idea. But we were sitting at a at a ping pong table. That's the whole table they use for all the meetings, including board meetings, right? So you think about these small companies when they started, and they are competing with big company. What what's the resource they have, right? So really, the team, the the brain power but also they need some capital, and extremely high risk. So that's where the venture capital comes in. And um, so this is give you some uh, macro data. Usually this is not published in other industry research, but this is showing how much money is being raised by VCs in US and in China. And this is a number actually is very, very surprisingly. In the US it's about, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the last year's number. It's about 260 billion, 265 billion. <coughs> Look at this number. In China, there are 277 billion US dollar equivalent funding being <coughs> raised for these VC funds to invest in startups. 
I'm one of them. <laughs> I founded the Lightspeed China. Uh, I, I can speak about it, and there are all the funds, we, every fund is oversubscribed, there's a big demand, we just can't, we have to say no to investors. But this number worries me, because if you look at the China market itself, I think it's still smaller, much smaller. It's getting bigger, but it's smaller compared with US. But too much money here, right? So that, speak about the institution investors. These are pension funds, insurance, and globally from US or university endowment. They, they are looking for highest return and with manageable risk. And they search everywhere in the world, and they really, the consensus is the China, that venture return is as meaningful as in US. And uh, it is true. I, I think, for example, our fund, we measure by uh, annual return and uh, uh, net multiple return. We are actually, if you compare it with all the US VCs, we rank uh, at the top 5% performance-wise for every fund we had. So, so that, that's the interest for people to put money in the institutions. But it, it creates, in my, in my view, sometimes a bubble. So if you hear about these unicorn companies, the valuation, sometimes there's a little bit inflated uh, because there, there are a lot of capital going there. But it's actually good for entrepreneurs uh, because they, they can access the capital and grow the business. So that, that's, a, uh, that, that's the both sides of the coin. Um, and also the, the exits. Um, and, and if you look at the entrepreneurial ecosystems, um, one thing is very important is VC, but the other part is um, how do you exit? This is a term that VC used in that because they invest the institution money in a for return because these private company, you can't sell the stock easily. So usually the exit are two venues. One is IPO, the other is uh, acquisition. So, uh, so a lot of company took the IPO pass, and, but other companies sold it. So those are the uh, two channels. And, the, and if, um, if you look at the Chinese venture industries, and their US IPO is very active, although if you see the, uh, uh, the activity is really picking up, um, but the domestic IPO also in Hong Kong, those are the additional venues for, for these uh, startup companies. Um, so, um, but overall, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I was uh, talking to some of the students and uh, the people are thinking about the startups and they always curious about what's the next opportunities, right? And uh, so that's something I can comment very quickly is um, we invest in China, but also I have my partners at Lightspeed US investing in the US, US market. Um, you, I, I actually very curious about this data point. How many of you use Snapchat? Okay, about half. Yeah, so Snapchat is uh, our Lightspeed US uh, investment. We invested $1 million when they were two undergrad students. And um, uh, we own 10% of the company, and uh, it's just literally two students and building a prototype. And uh, turned out to be a very, very, very important social network products. But one thing is, if you look at past five years for the old IPOs in the consumer internet space in the US, the big companies actually is limited. Snapchat is one of them. But So that speaks about the opportunities for startups for consumer internet. Um, because the internet has been really been around for a long time, mobile internet. So really in the US, the biggest opportunity actually is in the deep tech. So that's not a part a lot of people talk about. Um, and uh, in the, the deep tech could be AI related, could be um, um, the hardware or the cloud computing and the virtualization and the not consumer facing, but really enterprise more focused companies. And actually there are more billion dollar IPOs in the deep tech enterprise compared with consumer internet. So in our US fund, two thirds of our funds are investing in those areas only one third invest in consumer internet. Um, China is a little bit different uh, because the consumer behaviors and there's still a lot of green spaces. 
So we are about two thirds in the consumer internet and one third in enterprise. And uh, um, there's some very interesting opportunity in China. Actually, we call it, we don't have a term for that, we call it Internet Plus. So really using internet technology to transform some traditional industries. I'll give you one example. There's a um, logistics industry. And uh, if you look at China GDP growth, there's so much growth. And if you look at the highway, all the trucks, 18 wheelers. And if you look at the US companies, they are mostly owned by, the trucks are owned by fleet companies. But in China, 95% of these tr big trucks are actually not owned by companies. They are owned by the drivers themselves. They are entrepreneurs themselves. Sometimes the husband and wife, they live on that truck. They kind of take turn to drive. And uh, so, so this is a traditional industry, very, very big, not as efficient because they are individual drivers. So on average, when they take a cargo from Shanghai to Beijing, and they have to figure out what to take back. Average time they have to spend two and a half days to live in Beijing, and they have to go to the offline market and look for what's the right cargo for them to take back. But they are all using smartphones. So we invested in a company. They build effectively Uber for trucks in China. So these truck drivers, they can get on these mobile marketplaces and really quickly figure out within half day what's the cargo to take back. So they are becoming the biggest virtual fleet companies. So those opportunities doesn't really exist in the US, but that exists because in China, because the economy is still in a relatively young growth stage. Um, so so that, that, that's, a, that's a, a kind of a slightly different uh, opportunities over there. And um, I uh, also um, I was every year I, I get actually uh, different uh, Princeton students, a lot of undergrads. Actually, they actually took their own initiative and found a summer intern in China, and they reach out to me. I think Princeton really has a good alumni database, and uh, so I usually spend time with them and we talk about uh, giving them some advice and. Uh, um, so they always ask uh, for entrepreneurship-oriented, mindset-oriented students what we can do to prepare ourselves better for future careers. And uh, so that I, I thought about that. I think it's, uh, there are more and more students and, uh, with Keller Center resources. I think this is, this is so much better than when I was at Princeton. Right, and uh, so I have to actually co-call Intel to get, just get a summer intern at a big company, right? Um, so I, I, I think it's, this is, if you look at a global economy in the US, the biggest market cap companies, public company, used to be Exxon, right? A um, lot of traditional industries, but now the biggest one are all tech companies. And they all started as a small startups. So the entrepreneurial mindset, I think it's, it's really important because um, the globalization and a lot of the changes of the opportunities, even what you learn today at, at Princeton, 10 years, 20 years ago, could be very different. We learn about artificial intelligence, but what's, what we are talking about AI is very different from 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So getting that Entrepreneur, what is entrepreneurship, right? What is that mindset? I, I, to me, is really you find a pain point in people's life. Could be in business, could be in consumer internet, or could be in other space. It's really a pain point that people have. And a person really figure out a solution, but really take the risk to go do it. And so that, that kind of a mindset, um, I think to, to me, when I was at Intel, when I was at Google, um, although I didn't take Cala Center entrepreneur class at that time, but I, I, I think it's really, really important. And uh, even at Google, and uh, so the reason I joined Google is really to go build Google China. It's, it's, I can talk another two hours about that journey, right? It's very, very challenging. And, uh, um, 
but it's really building something from, from scratch. And you have to be very, very resourceful and think about the all the different angles. That, that's entrepreneurship. Um, so I, I, I think it's uh, uh, having that kind of knowledge and exposures at Princeton. And, uh, and also, I, I really encourage to think about these programs like PSIP or the, what we call it, the Summer Acceleration, the eLab. Uh, because you really actually go do it. Instead of we read about it, talk about it. So that's very valuable. Um, and um, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's fortunate that we have, we have that support infrastructure to, to do that. Um, and, and also another part is uh, when we look at what company to invest, so a lot of people ask me, um, how can you do these successful investments? Because I have eight companies I invested when they were very, very small. They all become public now. They are all multi-billion dollar companies. Eight companies is actually not easy, right? But if you look at the success factors, number one, who do you want to take a guess? What's the most important factor for a startup success? Bingo. It takes more than just the CEO founder to do the whole startup. And the team is so important. And uh, when I was at Google, I, 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 I turned them down for employee number 20 offer, right? So when I joined them, the biggest question I had was why they were successful for the same three and a half year period. I did my own startup, went sideways, right? They took off. What's the secret sauce? Very quickly, I realized it's the people. And there's one story I can share with you. They, they really hired the people. They, they, they were a little bit too extreme. They look at its GPAs. Even the company is a 10,000 employees. Larry Sergey, when they look at the new hires, they have a spreadsheet because so many new hires, right? They actually go verify the GPA. They don't take your report of GPA by, for granted. And the, the, there, there was a kind of a story that there was uh, early days, and uh, there's uh, one person in the company, they, they, uh, they lost the, the key in the garage. They didn't take it. So someone picked it up and turned it into the front desk. So the admin sent an email, who happened to be, I, I don't know if it's a Princeton grad, or they sent an email writing a poem about who lost the key, right? And then, <laughs> and then very quickly, a person from engineering department, an engineer, wrote back another email, wrote a poem, and I commented on, and, uh, and then very quickly, we got another email, a person from sales department, he wrote an email, this time not in a poem, but in a pseudo code of a programming. <laughs> and then, Eventually, take, 10 minutes later, there's Eric Schmidt, who's Princeton alumni, and he's the CEO. He wrote an email say, hey, you have a bug in your program. <laughs> <laughs> and that speaks about the quality of the people. Uh, the, the really, the thinking is the A type people, the class A people, high class A. And if you really lower your bar for the people, that, that kind of goes down. And the early, particularly the early small team sets the culture. So I would really encourage you, when you are at Princeton, reach out to your peer students. When you are both in the uh, old activities sponsored by the Keller Center, and the, they could be your future co-founders. And that core group of people is so important for the success for any of the, the companies. So with that, and, uh, I will open for any questions. And uh, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Rachel. I'm a senior. Um, I know you talked about the quality of people, but like, from the side, I'm
that's very good. So at Google, <clears throat> there one aspect we really look for is people are has smart, hardworking, passionate about users. But another very important part is people don't have the ego. And many times, very capable people are. They, they, they tend to have their own ego, but Google really tried to avoid that. Hiring those people it just tend to be a, um, I'm the hero, right? And they really look for people who are team players. And uh, so, so that, that's, that's uh, really one aspect of people uh, look for. And from my perspective, and looking at successful entrepreneurs, um, one thing I, I really feel that is important is the learning capabilities. And to give you an example, the company called Pinduoduo, I mentioned, it's an e-commerce company, grow from zero to now 22 billion market cap, a public company. The founder is a serial entrepreneur. He worked at Google and, uh, uh, for three years, and his early, earliest employee quit Google, and he did three startups. But one thing he really is good at is keep learning it. And every time we get together, and uh, Usually the founder would tell me that, oh, my company is doing well for this quarter and these are the progress we have made. He's the person who never talk about his achievement. He always talk about, oh, I ran into this problem. What do you think? And he always constantly thinking about uh, challenges, how to solve it, and try to get a mentorship and learn from other people. And, uh, and he, he really just engineered at the beginning. I don't think he's as, as sophisticated, but that kind of learning capability really over that long period of time, and he's probably one of the best strategic thinking mind right now. So that enables him to do something even much better later. Hey, uh, my name is Kelvin, I'm a sophomore. And I'm wondering if you can speak to, like you mentioned, how um, the markets in China are very different from the markets in the United States. I'm wondering, given like, the also different like, political climate, um, what, what the different factors are uh, in investing in the U.S. compared to the U.S. Sure. I think a um, uh, very good question. Uh, uh, I, I think this is any market that there's risk, there's uncertainty, um, and uh, certainly is something you'd really have to be aware of. Um, so for, unfortunately for China, I think the uh, for uh, tech industry is also driving the growth of the economy. It's the biggest part of it, similar to the US. And the regulations, uh, it's different. And um, um, so what we really focus on, the sectors that you don't really have to depend on government favorable policies because the political winds can blow differently, right? So we really invest in companies, and that's our suggestion to startups. Really, you can build business on your own merit without relying on any of the political resources or the social connections. And that, fortunately, that, that's really a really, really big open field. There are so many green spaces, just like the logistic truck companies. And that's, that's something that uh, the government is also taking a very relaxed approach uh, try to let a company to grow, then uh, follow with the regulation, working with the top leaders. So, so that's something you be, need to be aware. Of, but also, um, I think it's uh, uh, actually opens up uh, some of the opportunities. Hi, um, I'm Cindy. I'm a freshman, and I'm interested in your opinion about the relationship between major choice and entrepreneurship, because there's this like a, a lot of pressure to choose engineering or or like a math. Based major, um, what do you think? Like, are the skills gained from that compared to maybe more of the humanities side? Very, very good question. Myself, I studied physics undergrad, and uh, I studied electrical engineering at the, at Princeton. But I think uh, anything you do eventually, the knowledge uh, you had is the most critical part. Is actually the critical thinking. Uh, and I think also very, very important is self-learning capabilities. So uh, for startups, you're addressing a problem, and there's no solutions. And uh, so for you, if, if the person can really learn things very quickly, 
there's so much online video content available, right? You can pick up things very quickly. So that, that's kind of the older skill set required. Um, but I would encourage for, I don't know, I'm, I'm advertising for Jen, uh, for the CS department, and taking some programming introductory class. I think, I think the CS programming is kind of another language, just like math. And having some basic understanding, I think it's, it's very useful. But you don't have to be taking that major. But just having that exposure. Because then you know, oh, this is a problem that potentially could be solved by programming or algorithm. And uh, that could be done by someone else. So I don't have to do it. But having that level of understanding. And, and also for EE and MAE, I think those, many of the engineering, I think it's very, very important these days because now the world goes beyond just algorithm. And uh, they're, um, actually, the, we talk about PCIP. The next PCIP is in Shanghai. And we handpicked about 10 companies, and very diverse companies. They are top leaders in blockchain technology, top company in the self-driving car industry, which is building the LiDAR, which is a laser-based radar. Um, and these are engineering. Really, you need to solve it. And uh, having that, some of the exposure, I think it's also possible. But I think humanity, um, absolutely. There we have uh, another um, Princeton alum founded a company. He graduated uh, from Princeton with a master degree in architecture. And uh, he's a design person. He doesn't write code. But now he's building a very successful company. And it will be part of the PC program. That, so he has built an online marketplace for serving, now has served about 80,000 companies. And for all the creatives and, uh, uh, in the design and uh, leveraging the online marketplace to, to, and also the data uh, to, to very disruptive and innovative new technology that can solve it. So I don't know. I'm not sure if you mentioned it in your presentation, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on why there's such a drastic difference between IPOs in China. Oh, OK. Um, you mean the numbers or the valuation? OK. Yeah, I the, OK. Yeah, I think the uh, China IPO is a very interesting process. And uh, um, there's a SEC in China. They have a requirement that company going public in China has to be profitable. Um, so they're, <laughs> it's kind of weird, right? <laughs> the biggest reason is all the investors in China stock market, most 80% are retail investors, mom and dad. And they exchange hands. The first day trading, usually exchange hands 120 times, 120%. So these are retail investors. They, they just sell stock on the same day. Versus in the US IPO, 80% of the investors are institution investors. They hold it for a longer term. So the China SEC say, hey, we need to protect these individual mom and dad. And uh, so you have to be profitable. Otherwise, you shouldn't go IPO. So they're, all the tech companies, Amazon haven't been profitable for how long? 15, 16 years, right? But they are the biggest market cap company in the, in the whole world now, right? So, so tech companies tend to grow. They don't really generate profit initially, but eventually to be very profitable. So they, these companies, the biggest ones, are not allowed it to be listed in China because they are not profitable yet. But the ones that are profitable, also growing, they are small numbers, and they got bid up. So the price really, the PE multiple actually usually twice as high as a comparable you would get in the, in the US stock market. So there are more and more companies, they want to get get on China Stock Exchange because the P multiple is higher. But they are working on the profit. So that, that, that's the reason. Um, hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, I'm a sophomore in the CS department. I come from Tianjin. Um, I have a question about the um, Chinese companies growing in China's space. However, recently we've We've seen quite a lot of controversy regarding, for example, the product quality of Pinduoduo and passenger security. So, as an investor, how would you balance? 
their social responsibilities? That's a very, very good question. Um, so you, you heard about Didi and that they're, they're, they're the biggest Uber kind of a ride sharing platform in China. There are unfortunately their are uh, criminal acts and uh, the, the, the people got murdered and uh, um, they're, they're, I think the company should take more stronger measures and uh, but it's sometimes it's, you can't solve 100% of the problem but uh, this is a, this is talks about the social responsibility for startups and I would say even beyond that um, um, we as VC we actually are really trying to think about going beyond because um, you know the globalization the, the, the divide of the, the haves and the haves nots are getting bigger and you can say the technology is partially to be blamed because a lot of the technology developed and automated work and the, the people don't necessarily have these uh, labor work right so how do we invest responsibly and also create values for the society and also bring the wealth not for the select few, but for the general society. That, that's something we, we all think about. So DD, absolutely, PDD, that's something we really focus on. The long-term growth of the company is depend on the sustainability and the positive value you create for the whole society. And um, I think the, um, there's sometimes there's pressure from the, in, the financial markets, right? But uh, now the, the, I think the, the positive ways is actually they, they will realize this is very, very critical for their future growth. And more importantly, the second part of the question I talk about. So we actually very actively invest in online education. And we think a lot of the blue collar workers and they don't have necessary education. And with the advance of technology, they are left behind. That's happening everywhere in the US. In UK, and you see that social phenomenon, and uh, and it's happening in China. So how do you, in China, there, if you go to China, um, there are first tier, second tier cities. They, Shanghai just feels like Manhattan, right? But you go to third, fourth tier cities, hardware is there, really good facilities, There's bullet trains, and the, but education, there's no teacher. There's no good quality teacher. So how do you solve that? So we sponsor a Teach for America equivalent. It's called the Mei Li Zhongguo. It's really Teach for China. Also, the founder is Andrea is a Princeton undergrad. And he went to China over 10 years ago. He fell in love with it. And he stayed there for 10 years. He still haven't got his bachelor degree from Princeton yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on it. But we, we, we really want to make it more scalable because they have 700 college students. They graduate from top university, volunteer teach two years in the village, but that can only cover so many students. Uh, hi, my name is Shan, I'm a senior. Um, you talked a little bit about, I guess, Chinese ideas and US ideas, but I'm wondering a little bit about what you think about Chinese companies that are looking to debut on the US market. I've seen their valuation after Well, you're good. Are you become a Wall Street hedge fund investor? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think there's uh, uh, um, what's going on right now with the trade wall uh, between the US and China. That, that, that creates anxiety for the institution investors. So I think there's a pricing for some of the worst case scenario that's being reflected in the in the stock market price. That that's mostly the, the reason. And if you look at it fundamentally, a lot of the companies actually is growing and the multiple P model is very reasonable, but I think that we are at a period that actually has a lot of a pricing pressure. Hi. Hi, I'm Raymond. Um, I'm a local sophomore at a local high school, and I just want to first of all thank you for coming here today uh, for your invaluable experience and information. Um, I want to ask a question because I have a friend. Uh, he's the CEO of his own company. He's an entrepreneur, and uh, he makes his own custom Rubik's cubes for uh, uh, for international competitors. And um, he said that uh, he, when he was talking to me about like starting his own company, he said that the first year was often the most important year in terms of acquiring capital, in terms of getting the word out about your company. So I was wondering, 
once you started your own company, uh, what was the toughest struggle that you faced or the toughest moment that you faced, and how did you overcome it? Okay, good question. I, um, I was a little bit lucky. I raised eight million US dollars, but that, that's also a double-edged sword because when you raise too much money, you get comfortable, right? And then you, you had this very ambitious plan to build things, but really didn't get tested. So there's a, you probably teach about lean startup, uh, that you really want to don't scale it, test it, and have the market feedback before you scale it, because you might be on the wrong path. So my advice for uh, the startups, I invest most of the company when they were just one have an idea. So the first year, as you said, is very critical. So don't um, expend too much because startup, the resources, if you do too, much, too many things, it takes up all the resources in the small company you have. So you need to find almost a laser sharp point that, that's the most painful opportunities, that there's no solution. And you are the best person, a team equipped to address that laser focus on that. And hopefully, you grow out of that and has the opportunity to expand it into a large market opportunity. But focus on just address that particular problem. Narrow, narrow, narrow. Just say no to a lot of the temptations. Say, hey, we can do this. We can do that. Don't do that. And that will just drag you down because the speed is the only weapon we have. The big company, they have the users, they have capitals, and the but the startup in this garage, and the, they can be really disruptive because they move fast, and they iterate very quickly. And the team, again, building the first few people and grow there, that's the most critical part. And, and another thing I learned, I, I, I'm really bad at it, is when you hire someone, it's not a fit, fire the person, let go the person as quickly as possible. <laughs> hire slowly but five quickly. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if that's the last statement, but with that, <laughs> James, I want to thank you. We're, we're also going to open up the buffet in the back, and if you want to interact uh, at the end, there'll be opportunities, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.